there are some differences between your generation and the next generation, are there not? There are some differences, man. There are some things that are different. Um, and that's, that's tough. That's really tough. Sometimes it's just kind of fun and, and witty, you know, it's just kind of something that you kind of giggle at. But, man, sometimes it's, it's kind of, there are also some differences that are kind of troubling, aren't there? And the reason that it's troubling, it's really twofold, but because uh, I, I think we all remember what it was like we remember being there, and, and we have a hard time realizing that we're here. Like, wherever here is for you, whether that's your 20s, 30s, 40s, 100s, whatever it is, right? Like, we, we, it's hard to realize that we were here because we remember what it was like to be there. We remember when we were the cool ones, when we were the ones who had all the slang language that the adults had no idea what we were talking about. We remember what that was like. And so it's hard to realize that we're here and they're there, and there is a chasm of differences between us generationally. I think that for a lot of us, there are some really, really like funny, silly things. Oh, that's a weird slang term. Where do you guys make these up? But there are also some really troubling things too. I think there are some troubling things about the next generation that, that I don't have to tell you what they are. You already have them in mind. In fact, I bet you think about them with frequency. There are things about the next generation that bother you about the generation that's coming up, about Gen Z, Gen Alpha, and, and even to some, expect, you know, to some extent my generation, millennials. And, and so I think that that's problematic, that for so many of us there's such a wide chasm between the values, the passions, the interests, and yes, the slang of that generation versus our generation, your generation. The chasm is a problem, and the reason the chasm is a problem is, is, is because if you hope, and if I hope, to be effective for the sake of the kingdom for the duration of our lifetime, then it is important that we are able to connect with the next generation. Because you can't be influential in the kingdom over the course of your entire life if you're unable to or unwilling to connect with the next generation and influence the next generation. And so the fact that there is such a wide chasm of differences, that can be a problem. And so, and so I think what we really find, and, and we're going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks, but I think what we really find is we have two options. Um, we have two options. We can either just sit on our stoop and we can just kind of complain about the next generation and how they're getting everything wrong and all that. We can do that. I think that's fine. Or I'm hoping over the next two weeks, this is what we can find. I'm hoping that we can discover the other option, which is to find a better, more fulfilling, more kingdom impactful way to live out the rest of our days. Because I'm sure I'm not the only one who has ever looked at the next generation and had a moment where I looked at them and thought, we're doomed. You know, like I, I'm sure, and for some of you, you've done that two, three, four times now, where you look at the generation coming up and go, well, it was fun, right? Like, it's over now. And, and so I just, I hope that we can find a better way forward together because, because whether we want to admit it or not, they're next. They are next. They will determine and influence to a large extent the way that our country and culture and really our whole world operates. They're next. And so if we want to have kingdom influence for the duration of our lifetime, then we got to figure out how to join hands, how to link arms, and how to move the kingdom forward. And so that's what I'm hoping we can do over the next couple of weeks. So there was this dude named Paul. The Apostle Paul knew what it was like. Now listen, the whole generational thing, that wasn't a thing when Paul was around. That was, you know, 2,000 years ago. They weren't counting generations the way we're counting generations every 15 years or whatever, right? They weren't doing that. So that wasn't a thing back then. However, Paul did understand what it was like to be on the forefront, to be the forerunner, the front runner of a new movement that the, the people who were used to doing things the old way, not a fan of, not into it, having a real hard time adjusting. And Paul was on the forefront 
of that movement. And so Paul understood what it was to be the next generation, looking up at the generations that have come before and going, no, we need to do it this way now. So Paul knows what that's like. And he really, I mean, there, were a, there was a lot of opposition to that. In fact, so many of his letters were written in part to the people who really were part of the older generation and wanted to like, you know, they like wanted him to do things the old way. And Paul was like, no, new covenant, Jesus, we're not doing the temple model anymore. We're like, right, like Gentiles can be part of the faith now. Gee, the gospel is forever. And there were people who were having a really hard time with that. And so Paul knows what that's like. On the other hand, Paul is in a unique position because he also knows what it's like to be us. Because as the forerunner and really primarily responsible for the spread of Christianity throughout the known world at the time, Paul's missionary journeys took him to some cultures that he was extraordinarily unfamiliar with. And his mission then was to go into these cultures that he was unfamiliar with and to, to, to share the gospel and to raise kingdom-minded people in these foreign cultures. Paul knew Jewish culture. Paul knew Roman culture. You know, but the, the other stuff that he went, you know what I mean? Like that stuff was a little foreign to him. I don't know if you've ever felt like the next generation is maybe a little foreign to you, right? So Paul knows what it's like to be us, to have the mission of going into a foreign culture that have different passions, different values, some of which are very troubling, and then try to join hands, link arms, and move the kingdom forward. So Paul is on both sides of this coin. He knows what it is to be on both sides of the coin that we're trying to figure out how to navigate right now. And that gives us very good reason to pay attention when Paul has the experience he has in Athens. So we are in Acts chapter 17. If you're flipping there in your Bible, if you're not, that's cool. It'll come on the screen. But we are in Acts 17, starting in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, he was waiting for Timothy and Silas, two dudes who were with him on his missionary journey, and they were lagging behind, they were doing some stuff, and Paul was waiting for them. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. Can anybody resonate with that, right? Deeply troubled by all of the idols that he saw in this foreign culture. I, I don't even have to say it from the stage. You know what the idols and the passions and the values are about the next generation that as you walk through the city, you are deeply troubled by, right? You know, I don't have to say, y'all know what it is. You think about it often. I'm just pointing out that Paul knows what it's like to be you. He knows what it's like to look around and go, well, this is a problem, right? So Paul is in that position. And the question is, what is it, what is it that he did with that? Verse 17, he went to the synagogue to reason with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. And again, this isn't really anything all that enlightening. I'm just, again, I'm just, I'm just pulling us together with the text. I'm pulling us together with the text, helping us to realize that there is more synchronicity in what's going on in the life of Paul and the life of us than what we may have previously realized, because Paul did what most of us do, which is you see something troubling about the next generation or the foreign culture that you're trying to navigate or influence, and you go to some people who you know think like you do and have your, share your values and share your passions and all that, and you start talking with them. Hey, what's going on with that? You, you need to bounce your ideas. You need to make sure that you're in the right place. You need to check yourself, all that kind of stuff. You maybe even want to try to motivate and mobilize people to do, like, we got to do something about this. This is, this is going to be, this is what the world is going to become. We got to do something about it, right? So Paul finds himself in that same boat. He goes to the synagogue. He starts talking with some people who share his values, share his kingdom mindset, and they start chit-chatting about some stuff. And then he does do something about it. He goes out into public square and starts talking with anybody who will hear right? Here's what happens next. Verse 18. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said, <laughs> what's this babbler trying to say with these strange ideas he's picked up? And others said, he seems to be preaching about some foreign gods. And again, this is us, right? This is us. This is us. We, we, you know, has there ever been a time more so in American history where 
Christianity has come off as babble, right? It's come off as just like nonsense to the culture, particularly, particularly if you're talking with my generation, because my generation done rejected ourselves from Christianity. We are not interested. And so you talk about the next generation and you're trying, and it comes off as babble. They're not getting, and this is what Paul is experiencing. He's talking to them and it's just not connecting, right? They're, they're hearing him, but, the, but it's just not connecting, right? The God, right, they just, they're just like, yeah, this seems weird, you know? Um, and so Paul, Paul is like trying to figure out what to do with that. Fortunately, fortunately, Paul catches kind of a break, honestly. Catches a little bit of a break um, because, because he, he, there, we'll, we'll talk about it in the next verse. But before we get to the next verse, before we get to the next verse, um, the thing about us is even when we do find Christians who are part of whatever that next generation is, and we discover that they are already believers, even still there seem to be some, some, some quirks to their theological bent, right? There seem to be some ways that we feel they've twisted scripture or they've kind of oriented the, the, the Bible around whatever they think is right, right? There are some things about their theology and their view of God and the world that trouble us even when they do believe in Jesus. And so again, we find ourselves very much in the same position as Paul, where we're trying to communicate and influence and, and change some stuff, and, and it just feels like the generations we're trying to connect with are like, yeah, no, no thanks, right? Um, and so Paul gets lucky because while the Athenians aren't totally connecting with his message, they are willing to listen. They are willing to hear more. And that's what we find out in verse 19. They took him, then they took him to the high council of the city. Come and tell us about this new teaching, they said. You were saying some rather strange things, and we want to know what it's all about. It should be explained that the, all the Athenians, as well as the foreigners in Athens, seem to spend all their time discussing the latest ideas. And can I just say, if, if you weren't aware of this, can I just point out, this isn't true of every member of Gen Z and Gen Alpha, but can I just point out that Gen Alpha and Gen Z are a lot more like the Athenians in verse 19 than, than maybe we realized? Because the truth of the matter is, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, but particularly Gen Alpha, which are the kids that are currently going into middle school, um, they're not anti-Christianity they just don't know much about Christianity, right? They're not de-churched, they're unchurched. Because the millennials, my generation, the generation that rejected Jesus, rejected church, rejected all of the started the faith deconstruction movement, right? That generation is now the generation that's raising the kids who are going in, into that Gen Alpha years, right? And to some extent, Gen Z as well falls into that category. So the next generation, I think what we would discover is that they're not hostile to the gospel. They just haven't really heard it before. Like they're familiar with, with, with you've heard some of it from like politics, yeah, that's great. Uh, they've heard some of it, but they're not really familiar with the real thing, right? They've, they've heard some about churchianity. That, oh, they heard about churchianity. Y'all know churchianity? That's where you, where you go to church on Sundays, and then you just live, you just are all kinds of broken, and, and, and you know, you just, all, all your wounds are leaking out all over everybody, all over the place, Monday through Saturday. You just, you just all kinds of jacked up, but on Sunday, you pretend to be a perfect family, but Monday through Saturday, you, you just, it's just a train wreck. Um, and then, and then, but because of the Sunday thing, because you're, you're, you're part of churchianity, you then have to kind of like have the moral high ground. So you make sure that you, your kids, everybody in your family, we are a family that judges everybody else for sinning differently than we do, right? That's churchianity. Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they might be familiar with some churchianity, but the gospel? No, they don't, they don't know nothing about that. They don't know nothing about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I think what we would discover if we were to engage with the next generation, the generations coming up right now, I think what we would discover is that they're not de-churched, they're unchurched. They're kind of like the Athenians. 
Our ideas might sound a little strange to them, but I, I bet we would be surprised to discover that they would be curious to know more. Here's, I don't have time for this because I'm already running out of time. That game took way too long in the beginning. All right, but um, <laughs> I don't have time for this, but it's important, so I'm going to talk about it anyway. Like, no, I'm going to wait. I'm going to talk about it at the end of the message. Y'all going to have to wait. It's good, though. I can't wait until you hear it. <laughs> So that's just, that's just a few Gen Z, Gen Alpha. They're really just a few steps ahead of, of where the Athenians were. The Athenians have heard nothing about Christianity, Gen Z, Gen Alpha. They've heard a little bit, but not really the, the real deal. And so Paul, seeing his opportunity, he makes the most of it. And what he says in the next verse or two, I think should change the, the lens through which we see interacting with the next generation forever. Verse 22. So Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I noticed that you were very religious in every way. For as I was walking along, I saw your many shrines, and one of your altars had this inscription on it, To an unknown God, this God, whom you worship without knowing, is the one I'm telling you about. So when Paul was walking through the city of Athens, he was deeply troubled by the idols that he saw there. However, when Paul was walking through the city of Athens, he not only paid attention to the parts of the things that they value and were passionate about and pushing for that he found troubling, he also paid attention to the parts of the things that they value and are passionate about and are pushing for that gave him hope. Right? He wasn't just paying attention to what was wrong with the foreign culture, what was wrong with the foreign generation. He also paid attention to what was intrinsically a characteristic of those, that culture, that just seemed to have some, a little kingdom in it. There seemed to be a little kingdom, and there's a little gospel in that, and Paul brought that to their attention. He, he found that avenue, and before he ever said, y'all need to figure, look, we got to get rid of the idols, the idols are bad, before he ever condemned the parts of their values and passions and the things they were pushing for that he disagreed with, found troubling before he ever condemned any of that. Paul said, I just want you guys to know that you, without even knowing it, Athenian culture, without even knowing it, you have already created space in your paradigm for the gospel. It's already there. And I just think, oh, I just think that, I think that we would benefit from that. I just think we would benefit from that kind of thinking. I think we would benefit from looking at the next generation. And before we ever condemn the things that we find troubling, we would, first, look, we got to get to that. We, we got to get to that stuff because it is troubling. But, but before we do that, what if we looked for the things that are intrinsically true about that generation and we found the, the pathway toward the kingdom. And, and that's what we use to influence them. That's what we use to talk to them about. That's what we use to draw them in to a gospel-oriented mindset. What if we, we found that avenue? Because let me tell you, it's there. It's there. Can I give you a couple of examples? I'm going to give you a couple of examples, okay? This is Gen Z I'm talking about mostly, okay? I don't want to do all of this work for you. I think you would benefit greatly from doing some of this work yourself, sitting, reflecting, thinking, talking with the Holy Spirit, paying attention to the culture, and then coming up with some of these yourself and going, huh, huh, you know, I think, I think you would benefit from that. But I'm going to give you a couple just to get you started, okay? Gen Z. Gen Z is a group of self-starters, that is a group of self-starters. This next generation, they done launched more nonprofits, more businesses, more music albums. Like, they are a self-starting group. If you found yourself extraordinarily frustrated with the entitlement and laziness of my generation, you should be thrilled, thrilled with the bounce back of grit and determination found in Gen Z, because them is some self-starters. That is kingdom stuff, ain't it? There is an easy avenue toward kingdom conversation and kingdom transformation when we talk about being self-starters, that being intrinsically the case in their generation. We, 
we have, we have so many students in our youth ministry at this church who have produced music albums, who have started nonprofits, who have started businesses, who are starting different things to help with mental health, and, and they've got businesses. They've got all this stuff. This is a self-starting generation. It's a good time. That's an easy pathway toward kingdom conversation and kingdom transformation. Let me give you another one. Gen Z, Gen Z is extraordinarily empathetic and passionately opposed to discrimination. Passionately opposed to discrimination. Dems, that is some Jesus qualities right there. That is some gospel qualities, okay? Here's the thing that we got to realize. You might not agree with the, 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 the area that, there, that this is playing out in. You might be biblically opposed to some of the areas where that, you know, discrimination. They're like, we're not doing that, right? And you talk about like, like empathy and, right? You might be opposed to some of the areas where that's playing out, but the value itself, man, that's, that is Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't get enough culture. I mean, he doesn't get enough credit in our culture for pushing back discrimination in his time. That dude pushed back so hard on discrimination against women, against Gentiles in his time and he don't get enough credit for it. That's his kingdom qualities. And if we can just ignore, if we can, if we can just hold ourselves back from getting too upset and too jumpy at the way in which they're applying those values and instead get excited about the values themselves, we can point the stick in another direction, right? We can, we can always point the arrow in another direction, but only if we're willing to do the hard work that it's going to take to gain influence first by, by valuing that as a kingdom quality before we condemn the way it's playing itself out, okay? Gen Z, Man, they, that's, a, that's a kingdom culture right there, I'm telling you. Ripe for redemption. It's not there yet, but it's ripe for it. It's there. You can see the pathway. Let me give you another one. Generation Z is less driven by a quest for objective truth than they are a sense of belonging. They, they want to belong. Like whether or not something is objectively true it's not that it doesn't matter, it's just that it matters less. And so they want to belong. They want to find somewhere where they can acceptance, belonging, uh, authenticity, right? That stuff is, is the primary influencer for generations like Gen Z. And that's probably really frustrating for you. And it's frustrating for me too, because relativism is nonsense. It's, it's intellectual, it's nonsense. It's nonsense, and we know that. We get that, sure. But there is space for this in the kingdom. There's space for this. You can make space for their longing for belonging before their quest for objective truth. The reason I know you can make space for that is because Jesus made space for that. Because the disciples were way more on board with who Jesus was and the way that he made them feel, the way that he accepted them before they ever really understood what it was Jesus was getting at. They, they felt the belonging way before they understood to, to any real degree what Jesus was about and what he came to do. And so I, think, I just think Jesus made space for it. Here's what this means for you. This is good news. This is, I know you might be frustrated. I am too. But this is good news. The reason this is good news is because it means that for all of us, for those of us who don't have a doctoral degree in, in, like, in like defending creationism, right, or whatever, we, we don't have to write a 60,000 word like dissertation on the, on the geological evidence for the flood of Noah in order to reach Gen Z. You don't have to have all of the answers because while truth matters, what is going to be far more impactful for this generation than for many of the generations prior, what's going to be far more impactful is that there is something real and something authentic going on in you as a result of your relationship with Jesus. When they see that, when they feel the effects of that, when they feel drawn into that, it's going to be really influential. They may want to be part of your community before they even believe what you believe. How awesome would that be? 
yeah, they, you know, I'm not really sure if I like agree with the whole Christianity thing, but there's something to it. I'm trying to figure it out. There's something to it, right? That would be great. We would love that. We would love that. You know what I realized? This is what I was going to say earlier, and I decided to push it down. So, you know what I realized as I was driving in the car this morning? I've been chewing on this for, for quite some time. I realized that the things that Gen Z and to some extent millennials really seem to value um, emotional health, right? Um, a strong sense of identity and, and the ability to forgive yourself and um, a, a strong sense of this is who I am. I'm imperfect, but this is me. I was li- in fact, I was listening to The Greatest Showman on the way to church. I don't know why. I just, I, fe- I literally felt like God was like, I was like, I'm gonna listen to a worship song on the way to church. And God was like, this is me, Greatest Showman. I was like, worship God. He was like, this is me. So I was listening to it. <sighs> It just occurred to me, like, that's so, oh, it so accurately depicts the mood of this generation. This is me. Look out, here I come, right? I, I'm, I'm not afraid to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me, right? This, this generation, they are chasing after a hollow version of the freedom available to them in Jesus Christ. They're, they're pursuing it so hard. They, they are trying to f- secure themselves in the type of, of solid identity that they would find in Jesus, in the gospel. They just don't have any basis for it yet. They have no basis for it, but they're saying the same things we're saying. I'm flawed, and that's okay. I'm flawed, but I still have value. These are just gospel principles where they took the Jesus out of it. They don't even realize it, but Gen Z has created space all over the place for the gospel. They just don't know it yet. So what if we were a people who instead of spending all of our time shaking our fists at the way that they're applying the, the, that all of those values and passions, what if we took it back to the values and passions themselves and circled the things that are Jesus, circled the things that are gospel? And those are the things that we affirm in them. Those are the things that we, we use as a leverage point to influence them. I just, I just think there's a lot there. There's a lot there. I just think there's a lot there. I think it would be helpful. I think it would be better. I think, I think that that's how we impact the kingdom for the duration of our lives. I think that's how we, until the day that we pass on from earth, I think that's how we move the kingdom forward. I think that's how we continue to influence the next generation. And, and if you want to sit on the sidelines and you want to shake your fists and you want to do that, that's like, I'm not here to stop you. I just, I just think that this is a better way to live. I think you're going to live with a lot more excitement about the future. I think you're going to live with a lot more joy about the future. I think you're going to find that you're angry a lot less and that you're hopeful a lot more. There are some troubling things about the next generation. I'm, I'm, 100% with you. I'm 100% with you. My theology is, is, is standard. It's, you know, the orthodox theology, right? I'm with you. But the next generation is pursuing the, they want the gospel so bad and they don't even know it. What if we were willing to, to hold ourselves back and bite our tongue enough to show them the pathway toward what they're really pursuing? I just think it would be better. I think it would be better. Listen, over the course of this mini-series, um, I want to use a word picture. And, um, and, and I want that word picture to be that, you know, if, that every mature believer is like a full circle, okay? And that, that's, if every believer is a, a mature believer in Christ is a full circle, then, then as part of the older generations, our mission is to be circle makers for the next generation. And so with that in mind, here's the point. If you want to be a circle maker for the next generation, you need to admit that part of the circle is already there. You're not starting from scratch. There is the image of God didn't stop with your generation. 
right? It's just the, the, the future generation. There may be some trouble, but God is so faithful and so consistent. He planted his image in every generation that comes. And it's just, we just have to identify it. It might be a different piece than what was the case in your generation, but if we would just stop with this, this ridiculous, this ridiculous sense of my generation is the best, if we would just stop with that nonsense and look for the kingdom values that are present in the next generation, I bet you we would find them. And I bet you we could leverage them to make the future of our country and the future of our world a better more gospel-oriented, more kingdom-minded place. And we'll pick this up more next week. So God, thank you so much that you are a God of generations. You, you use generation after generation to push your kingdom forward. You have never failed to do so, and I don't believe you're going to fail to do so now. God, we want to be people who are helpful. We know you're going to do it anyway. You don't need us. You're going to do it anyway, but we want to be helpful. We want to be part of the mission. We want to be part of pushing your kingdom forward. So God, I pray that whatever it is we need to get over, that you would help us to get over it. Whatever it is that we need to sideline, I pray that you would help us sideline it. Whatever it is that we need to push off and have that difficult conversation later, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to do so. Lord, help us identify the pieces of gospel that are already present in the next generation and then give us the wisdom and the grace to know how to help them navigate it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.